Hi, everyone. We're looking at chapter 11 this week, disorders related to sex and gender. Uh, oftentimes, when we're meeting in person, uh, I tend to assign this chapter uh, to you on your own to cover. It's a little bit, in my opinion, a little bit beyond the scope of our abnormal uh, psychology class, just because it does require a little bit of um, extra knowledge and education related to um, our sexual response cycle and a little bit of things related to human sexuality. But we'll go through it um, a little bit and I'll give you um, just a little bit of background and some of the different uh, you know, disorders that you might see or dysfunctions that you might see in this chapter. Uh, we just won't go into them in great detail uh, because of uh, that background that's a little bit needed. So make sure you're definitely reading the, the chapter in the textbook as well, uh, which will provide you even more background and, and information related to these. But we'll look a little bit at um, sexual dysfunction, a couple of different phases um, of our sexual response cycle, which contribute to and kind of shape these different disorders. And then a few disorders related to pain, paraphilias and fetishes, um, and then also related to gender at the very end. Uh, so when we look at this, at this chapter, we're talking about sexual dysfunctions a loss or impairment of the ordinary physical responses of sexual functioning, um, a disorder marked by persistent inability to function normally in some area of the human sexual response cycle. Now, I want to point out right here on this slide that some degree of sexual dysfunction every now and then is completely normal and often expected. Right, uh, a person's sexuality and their level of interest in sex is very much shaped by things like stress, uh, by their partner's actions, by their own emotions and actions. If somebody isn't um, doing the proper things to stimulate you, that isn't a sexual dysfunction. It just might be an environmental or kind of partner-related failure. Um, if you have too much um, alcohol or too much to drink or ingest certain substances, those might interfere with your body's ability to go through its normal and typical um, physical and sexual responses. And that isn't a disorder. So when people have these periodically where they're not in the mood or maybe they don't respond as strongly, uh, that is very, very normal. Um, and a lot of it might have to do with the level of like stimulation from a partner in addition to your mood, level of anxiety, level of stress, the list goes on and on and on. But when this is something that is persistent and it's happening across circumstances, it's happening repeatedly, then we might be looking at something that's more of like a, a global sexual dysfunction. And we typically talk about these as they relate to the stages of the human sexual response cycle. Right? So research done by researchers called uh, named Masters and Johnson years and years ago identified four different phases that people go through as they respond to arousal or go through um, kind of typical sexual interactions. They have a phase of desire, a phase of excitement, plateau, orgasm, and then typically there's like a resolution or kind of a calming down that happens as well. Um, differences between men and women for sure and how they respond sexually and what this cycle might look like. But we oftentimes use this as kind of a starting point to talk about disorders related to desire or excitement or orgasm. Much uh, less common to talk about ones related to resolution. So if we go and we talk about desire phase difficulties, this is the phase of the response cycle consisting of that urge or desire to have sex for sexual fantasies, attraction to others. This is somebody's level of desire. And sometimes despite wanting to have more desire, people have a very depressed or very low level of arousal or interest. So we can have something called male hypoactive sexual desire disorder, HSDD, um, a male dysfunction marked by a persistent reduction or lack of interest in sex and a low level of sexual activity and desire. So we specify here whether this is in men or women, we do kind of divide them up um, diagnostically. And for women, we might call this female sexual interest or arousal disorder, where people have a persistent reduction or lack of interest in sex, low sexual activity, um, in some cases, limited excitement and few sensations during any kind of activity, but we're more so looking at the desire here. There just isn't a lot of interest or desire um, in engaging in any kind of sexual activities with um, another person or even individually. 
right? So low level of fantasies, attraction, and low levels of urges or desire um, to engage. This could be caused by something biological, right? Abnormalities in hormones play a huge role in, in people's level of sexual interest. Also medications and substances. There are a lot of different medications and substances that can reduce somebody's desire and also reduce the way that their body is responding, the amount of blood flow that somebody might be having, which plays a really big part in arousal. Um, we can also see a lot of psychological factors. When people are anxious, depressed, right, or they have a lot of uh, maybe fears of pregnancy, or right, there's a lot of stress in their life, all of those things can play a huge role in desire. And everybody, there's just so much variability when it comes to desire anyway, but you add higher levels of anxiety or depression or anger, stress, life circumstances, those things can very easily uh, be desire killers in a sense. There are also some sociocultural causes um, that we can talk about situational pressures, relationship issues. If somebody is in a relationship where they're having you know, struggles in, with intimacy, that can obviously play a role with this as well. Differing needs between partners. Maybe one partner thinks the other one has a very low level of desire, but it's only because they have a very high level. Um, discrepancies between partners can often cause uh, some issues for people as well. Cultural standards, any kind of history of physical or sexual trauma can also play a huge role in somebody's level of interest. So a lot of different factors can come into, into play here. When we look at excitement phase difficulties, this phase is the, um, the stage of the response cycle where we start to see physical changes occurring, where people are having that level of physiological arousal, increase in blood flow, increase in muscle tension um, as people become aroused, right? So we see physical arousal taking place, heart rate picking up, muscle tension increasing, blood pressure, blood flow, rate of breathing, you're starting to see physical changes occurring as somebody becomes excited and aroused and engaging in some kind of, of uh, you know, sexual intimacy with another person. And the most common thing that we see here in the excitement phase is male erectile disorder or ED uh, as it's often called for short, uh, called for short. Uh, consistent or reoccurring lack of an erection sufficiently um, rigid enough for penetra penetrative sex. I need to slow down. Uh, so people who have uh, this for a period of three months or more, they're repeatedly failing to attain or maintain an erection during sexual activity. Now this is notoriously popular, right? And it's often made fun of, it's joked about constantly in the media. You hear all the things, especially with things like Viagra and commercials for it. But it's estimated that one in five men over the age of 20 suffer from this, right? Excitement phase difficulties related to maintaining an erection um, that lasts long enough and is sufficiently rigid enough uh, for penetrative sex. So uh, when people struggle with this or when men struggle with this, they can feel a lot of uh, embarrassment and shame, but it's, it's actually really, really common. And it gets more and more common as people get into their elderly years and they have um, issues with blood pressure or if they're taking medications that might alter their blood pressure. But this is something that is probably one of the more common uh, sexual dysfunctions that we're talking about. It can have a lot of biological causes, hormonal imbalances, any kind of vascular or heart related problems, damage to the nervous system. Um, for men, an erection is basically a, a physiological nerve nervous system related like response. There's a lot of uh, nervous system role that plays in it. And so there can be some kind of damage or vascular issues uh, with people are taking, as I said, any kind of like blood pressure medication, substances like alcohol make it very difficult for men to get an erection as well. It can also be related to anxiety. A lot of people um, develop performance anxiety during sex where they um, experience this tension and fear of performing inadequately, or maybe they get caught up in their mind and they're so worried about their performance that they're not able to kind of enjoy and be present in the moment. They take on more of like a spectator role than actually being actively emotionally, mentally, and physically involved. We can also see so sociocultural causes, um, you know, things related to relationships, jobs, stress. Stress, again, can be um, a very 
you know, strong impacting factor when it comes to somebody's sexuality. Uh, cultural attitudes, again, uh, this tends to be something that is often made fun of in the media, but it can be a very real struggle for a lot of people, one in five over the age of 20. And again, that number tends to, uh, tends to go up uh, every pun or no pun intended <laughs> um, as people get a little bit older. There are some um, orgasm phase difficulties as well. This is the phase of the response cycle in which somebody's uh, level of pleasure and physical response peaks. There's a lot, often a lot of sexual tension being released as the muscles have a lot of contractions. There's an increase in blood flow, but this is when somebody reaches that peak or orgasm and people can have difficulty here. Um, that men oftentimes have early or premature ejaculation uh, where they have orgasm before they wish to. Um, and this is very common in young men and common in men who are very sexually inexperienced um, and a little bit normal in that way. It can be a very normal occurrence for younger men um, until they develop a little bit more uh, stamina or uh, maybe experience. But then this can happen to people at any age uh, and they might have these kind of reoccurring difficulties where they are having difficulty with uh, maintaining an erection or having ejaculation before they wish to. You can also have something called male orgasmic disorder uh, where a man isn't able um, to reach orgasm. They aren't able to reach the point of ejaculation during stimulation from a partner. Or female orgasmic disorder where there's an absence, marked delay or diminished intensity of an orgasm. So we can see difficulty in somebody hitting that peak or hitting the point um, of kind of that, that peaking orgasm um, in a sexual response. Um, often the same stuff, right? It's a lot of the same causes that you're seeing over and over again. Um, lots of different medical conditions, medications that can play a role. Diabetes and some other medical conditions can also um, often very directly impact a person's ability to orgasm and maintain that level of arousal. Childhood traumas, any kind of um, stress and difficulties in relationships, um, again, any kind of trauma, anxiety, stress, depression, societal messages that women should hold back or deny their sexuality, different cultural impacts on religious influences, emotionality and the quality of relationships. So there's so many different factors that can play a role. And again, remember, this is somebody who, despite proper stimulation, right? So this isn't uh, due to improper like stimulation from a partner, right? If a partner is doing everything properly and, and your body is responding, but it's just not able to reach um, that peak despite a desire from you for it to do so. There are also some disorders of, of sexual pain. People can have genitopelvic pain or penetration disorder uh, where people have an intense amount of physical discomfort or pain during any kind of intercourse, lots and lots of different reasons why this might um, occur. If it's a purely biological issue um, due to like a, an anatomical structure, like a restricted hymen or other, other possible things like that, um, then we wouldn't put it in the mental illness category. But if people are maybe having pain or discomfort due to anxiety or trauma, uh, maybe uh, you know something that has happened in their past is making it where they feel very uncomfortable or they're experiencing some of that pain. There might be some degree of physical stuff going on as well, uh, but it can't be the only contributing factor. So there are um, quite a few times where people might um, develop some kind of, of pain in relation to their, um, you know, their sexual interactions where we might see a little bit of, of a mental illness uh, related factor playing a role. Lots of different treatments for these sexual dysfunctions. Um, therapy, a lot of people go to therapy. They might see somebody who specializes um, in working on um, issues related to intimacy or sexuality. Uh, a typical like average therapist might not be trained to go into this in great detail. Uh, it kind of depends on their comfort level. Um, oftentimes people are encouraged to keep a diary, um, to visualize, to rehearse, to maybe fantasize and try and work um, work through some of the things in their head ahead of time. There are some uh, other techniques like called uh, sensate focus. This is a very couple oriented activity where uh, there's a lot of like touching and communication um, in order to reduce some of that performance uh, pressure and anxiety. 
So maybe uh, focusing on communication with a partner. Do you like it when I do this or not? Uh, very kind of vocal and forward communicating with each other what feels good and what doesn't. There are lots of medications that people take, especially uh, to help with issues like ED, things like Viagra, Levitra, Cialis. Uh, you see commercials for these all the time on television, uh, but helping to increase blood flow uh, in order to help somebody to get uh, an erection. There's something called the stop start technique, not overly uh, popular of course, but it can definitely help uh, for things like premature ejaculation, stimulating uh, to the point of like an impending orgasm and then stopping and letting that sensation subside and then stimulating again, right? So stopping and starting to try and build up some of that stamina um, and stopping before the point um, of orgasm or ejaculation, right? Very, very common, um, especially in men in order to help to build up a little bit of that stamina. One other um, group that's often talked a lot about in this chapter are the things called the paraphilias. Paraphilia means beside love or kind of in addition to love. These are disorders or kind of uh, preferences characterized by recurrent and intense sexual urges, fantasies or behaviors involving non-human objects, children, non-consenting adults, or experiences of suffering, humiliation, um, kind of things beyond the usual, right? And we call this a paraphilic disorder or paraphilias. And one of the more common ones we talk about, uh, we talk about a lot is something called fetishistic disorder or fetishes. And I imagine uh, you've heard this term before, a fetish, where somebody has uh, like a preferred object that brings them a lot of excitement and arousal. A lot of people incorporate different um, objects or kind of accoutrement, if you will, uh, different things into their sexual interactions. But if somebody has a fetishistic disorder, they are not able to achieve like orgasm or stimulation or excitement without the object that they have a fetish of. So maybe they're not able to become aroused unless their partner wears high heels or unless they're, uh, somebody stimulates their, their foot, right? Um, people has, have like a fetish for a part of the body or an object and they're not able to proceed in any kind of interaction without it. But if both people in the relationship don't have a problem with it, then it's not a disorder, right? It would only become a disorder if it starts to interfere with a relationship or cause, cause problems, or maybe make it where you're not able to have uh, a sexual interaction that's positive or successful because you had to have that object present and your partner wasn't uh, comfortable or okay with it. There are lots of treatments for, for fetishes if they are causing problems for people. Um, there are ways to get over them. These are things that a therapist might work through with you. One is called masturbatory satiation, where you masturbate for long periods of time while fantasizing in detail about that object, right? So you fantasize about the object, you're almost trying to turn it into like boredom, right? It's almost like in a sense where, um, if you've ever heard of like a parent doing this where they, they make their child smoke, like their teenagers smoke an entire pack of cigarettes to the point where they get sick. And so they no longer want the object. Uh, not the best solution as they might not ever have done that, but sometimes we can use that procedure or that, that idea here um, of turning it into more of like a boredom. You almost take away the excitement and power of that stimulus uh, by doing it so often. You can also do something called orgasmic reorientation. Uh, where you try to teach clients to respond or, or patients to respond to more appropriate sources of stimulation. Right? So maybe trying to replace the fetishistic object with something a little bit more um, you know, traditional or something a little less harmful or um, impacting. There are an incredible number of paraphilias. I just listed a few of them. Um, on here, there are so many, voyeurism, exhibitionism, frauderism, transvestic disorder, pedophilia, uh, sadism and masochism, probably the two most uh, well-known and popular thanks to like Fifty Shades of Grey, uh, the movies and the books. Uh, when we talk about BDSM, bondage, discipline, sadism and masochism, uh, we're talking about two very common paraphilias where people either uh, obtain gratification from humiliating or harming a partner, or maybe enjoy having those things happen to them. 
And again, this isn't a disorder if you have a partner who's fine with it. If you are a sadist and your partner is a masochist, then you're probably very happy. But if you enjoy harming somebody and that's what um, allows you to become aroused and your partner is not into that or finds that to be repulsive or a turnoff, um, that's when it starts to maybe interfere and create some, some issues. The last thing um, in the chapter talks a little bit about gender dysphoria, sometimes called transsexualism. This is a very uh, controversial topic, right? And it's been renamed and kind of moved around and reorganized many times in the DSM. Uh, but this is a disorder in which a person persistently feels extremely uncomfortable about his or her assigned sex. And they strongly wish to be a member of the opposite sex. So very common and gender roles in our society are constantly changing and shifting and evolving. And they're much more fluid and flexible than they used to be. We have an incredible spectrum of gender presentations uh, in terms like gender fluid and gender queer and all sorts of things like that. Uh, but someone who struggles with their gender identity may reject traditional gender roles, wear clothing of the opposite sex um, or gender. And this is not for arousal, but this is more for identity. So they're not wearing um, items of the opposite sex like clothing to become aroused, but it's because it's what they feel comfortable with. Maybe even trying to pass as the opposite um, sex, right? Trying to uh, take hormones or go through different procedures to make their body match their internal vision of how they should be. And in uh, you know, cases where people feel this way very strongly, uh, they might even pursue like a sex reassignment or um, sex affirmation surgery where they change their organs and features and in turn their physical biological sex to match their gender identity. So maybe you have someone who was born female, but they feel very strongly that they should have been born male. Maybe this individual rejects their traditional gender roles. They might go by a male name, try and pass as male, and eventually go through some kind of surgeries or procedures to make that, uh, that vision a reality. Uh, and this is something that, again, is still included in the DSM, uh, but it continually gets challenged and evolves uh, as just wearing the clothing of the opposite sex is, is something that is uh, very controversial, right? How do we define what clothing is acceptable or not? Um, and so uh, this, again, tends to be uh, something that, that gets debated and talked about quite a bit. All right, so uh, that is everything on, on chapter 11. And again, uh, maybe not as, as detailed uh, as some of the other chapters, but it does require a little bit of background um, and knowledge that, that sometimes um, I think kind of is, is too far for this class. I do teach human sexuality as a side note, traditionally in the fall, if you are uh, interested in joining me, very fun class. Um, I think obviously it's incredibly interesting, but for now, uh, make sure that you get going on all the required weekly materials, uh, make sure they get done before the posted deadlines, and I will see you next week for our next topic.